Everyone, and thank you very much for joining this webinar uh, from Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. This is the first of many, many events celebrating 125 years of LSTM, and I hope you'll be able to join many, many more of them. But it's a real delight to be able to chair this first event with you on such an important topic, and we've got a really stellar panel lined up for you shortly. So just to introduce the event, between the years 2017 and 2019, LSTM, together with Liverpool FC Foundation, developed a partnership project Project called Health Goals Malawi. And the aim was to use football as a way to bring people together and engage with hard to reach young men to disseminate sexual health messages. Uh, a research paper, a report was developed. Um, LSTM got some uh, funding from UEFA's Children Foundation with the support of LFC Foundation to deliver Health Goals Malawi in 2019. Now, of course, we know that the pandemic hit in 2020 and that did have implications uh, for the project, but nevertheless, it is ongoing and there were some really interesting results to share with you. And I'm really delighted to be able to introduce you to a brilliant panel that's incredibly knowledgeable, knowledgeable about this subject matter um, and will be able to, to share that information with us today. So I've just seen, I've just seen Kate pop up. Uh, let me introduce you to, to Kate first of all. She's the Head of Sport and Inclusion at LFC Foundation. She's got 15 years of experience working in the sport, health and community sector. I think she's worked at the LFC Foundation for four of those years and she's particularly passionate, passionate about using sport as a vehicle to empower communities and make positive change. We've also got Sarah Begg from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Um, now, Sarah is a PhD funded student. She's got an MSc in Global Health and Public Policy from the University of Edinburgh. Um, she's got an MR, MRES, I think it is, in Quantitative and trans, Transnational Skills and Global Health. That sounds so complicated. You're going to have to explain that one. Um, she's got a background in sport development and through her research, she's worked a lot of community level interventions in Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly on sports based and youth focused HIV education. So we're going to hear a little bit um, from from Sarah also. Um, two other panelists, Peter Dias is a program manager at Tackle Africa. Peter's got five years experience delivering sports for development projects, delivering vital HIV and sexual reproductive health information to young people across multiple districts in Malawi. Um, he's led the Malawi team in delivering projects to uptake HIV self-testing, um, reducing child marriage and teenage pregnancies, and increasing voluntary male medical circumcision in adolescent boys and young men. And then from the Malawi Liverpool Wellcome Trust Research Programme, we have Dr. Kondwani Jumbo, uh, a senior lecturer who's based at the Malawi Liverpool Wellcome Trust Research Programme. Um, Kondwani obtained a Bachelor of Science degree in Technical Education from the University of Malawi in 2004 and a Master of Science in Human Immunity in 2006 from the University of Liverpool. He was awarded the Commonwealth PhD Scholarship in 2007 and PhD in Tropical Medicine. Um, he joined the uh, Liverpool Wellcome Trust Clinical Research Programme as a postdoctoral scientist and helped develop the immunology laboratory. So we've got a really knowledgeable uh, panel here for you to talk about an issue that's so important um, and can't be emphasised enough. Sarah, why don't you kick us off and tell us a little bit about this project, how it came together and, and what the challenges were really. Sure, so um, the background of the project really was uh, this partnership piece between the LFC Foundation and the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And it kicked off with some capacity building activities in the city of Liverpool where coaches um, that had been identified by the Malawi Liverpool Wellcome Trust were engaged with the coaches um, here in Liverpool to uh, understand the opportunities that football could uh, potentially provide as a vehicle for social change and action. And that sort of developed as it went along um, to the point where there was a, a cohort of coaches in Chihuahua who were um, sort of built, they had their capacity built across multiple dimensions. So um, there was training in football coaching as a pure skill, as it were, from um, uh, the Malawi FA. There was training um, and support from PSI who uh, provide HIV self-testing kits in, in that, that region of Malawi. So you know, showing how to demonstrate how to use uh, HIV self-testing self kits. There was uh, training from MLW around the key health issues that young people in Chihuahua face. You know, they're the, the major research institution in that area. And then 
um, from the LSE Foundation around the four corner model, which is basically how you can integrate all of these different facets within football to make it more appealing and, and a more attractive way of engaging with young people in these important health issues. So that project sort of took part mostly in 2017 to 2019, um, although we've been very fortunate that Tackle Africa have then gone on to follow up those activities post pandemic um, and continue to work with that group of coaches and so much other new coaches as well to try and sustain that activity and they've been really successful with that. Um, the key thing really was that the coaches became massive role models in the community. So it's not just that, you know, it was football, but it was those coaches in particular were seen as really um, credible sources of information because of the capacity building they'd received from all of these different um, agencies and organisations that were involved in the programme. And it helped to break down that real fear of HIV testing, which I think we could all recognise as something that no matter who we are, um, the, the fear of uh, any kind of test, I think all of us probably have, even just doing COVID tests have had that moment of dread, um, you know, what's the result going to be? Imagine something uh, like HIV, which has lifelong consequences. So breaking down that fear and stigma of the test was, was the vital role that coaches really played in it. And using football and the power of the LFC badge to really get people excited about getting to those sessions and receiving those um, HIV tests that they could take home and use. So, so that was the, the main parts of the project, really. It's really interesting. We must touch on some of those issues that you've raised later, particularly that idea of fear of testing and how you overcome it. Um, you mentioned the power of the LFC badge. It's a good point to go to Katie. Katie, I'm sorry, I was calling you Kate earlier. I apologise. Um, Katie, tell me why it was so important for LFC to be involved in something like this. I think one of the main reasons that we partnered with LST on this programme was because we wanted to do more work overseas. But what we didn't want to do was just parachute in and leave. And I think one of the things that we were really passionate about in this programme was it was all about using sustainable change and really empowering communities. So we upskilled 25 coaches across the two years that we ran in the programme to actually go out and deliver the health messages when we left. And we came back to Malawi three times and we, we are hoping to go again in the future. COVID has stopped some of that as well. But I think from the LFC perspective and using the badge, it was really clear that football is really popular in Malawi. Um, and we wanted to be able to use role models like Sadio Mani to go to Malawi and explain why it's really important to get tested. But also we were really impressed and sort of proud to be part of a program where there was so much innovation around the testing. So it was the first time that they'd used a saliva based HIV testing kit in this project. And um, so for us to be able to articulate to people how to use it, how easy it is to use, how easy it is to get results from the start of the project when we were devising how we were going to do it. It was something that we felt um, we were really excited about, but we also felt we could make a really positive difference. And hopefully we have. Brilliant. And if anyone can persuade you to do something, it's definitely money, isn't it? <laughs> um, Peter, you've got a lot of experience um, on the ground. How difficult is it to persuade people to get a test? I mean, we, we, we are all afraid of testing, as Sarah said earlier, but how do you persuade people? Um, so looking at that point, um, Especially, especially young people, which is the target for this program. It's not, it's not very easy to convince a young person to go to a clinic to access HIV testing or community in general to go for an HIV test. This is not easy. But um, with this project, it became a bit easier because we're using the power of football. So as Sarah said, in Malawi, football is like really popular. If you meet a young person after school, they want to go to the pitch and play football. So with this, um, with this program, um, at South Africa, we were, we were happy. Uh, it's excited that uh, we joined uh, a partnership uh, with uh, uh, AeroSTM uh, to pilot this program and try to reach out to the coaches that they were trained two years ago and try to upscale the uptake of HIV self-testing kit. So it became a bit easier to uh, get the young people to uh, access the HIV self-testing kit uh, through the power of football. But uh, in general, it is not easy. It is not easy to get young people to get tested. And uh, you need um, tools like football, like a vehicle to uh, get the young people to get the information first and then uh, drive the demand and bring the service close to them so that they can access easier. So there'll be a lot of challenges. There will be um, fear of results. There'll be pressure from other friends. There'll be distance to the clinic to access it. But with the use of football, um, 
as the tool, as a vehicle to reach out to the young people, to give out the information first, and then create the demand uh, where young people would access the services really helped in this project that uh, a lot of young people accessed uh, the HIV self-testing kit uh, through the time we worked with the uh, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine post-COVID. That's great, Peter. It's and it's really good that you've pointed out some of the practical challenges. Just getting to the clinic can be can be a challenge. Um, Dr. Kondwani, could you give us a background as to what the healthcare challenges are? I mean, we, we're sort of talking about positive ways to get people to get tested. But how big a scale of a problem is this in Malawi, first of all? I think I would rather start with the, the, the success, I think, of Malawi first before we go to the problems. Um, I think Malawi is one of the few countries um, in the world, or maybe in Africa I can say that, um, which is doing very well in its fight against HIV in the sense that their first set of targets, for example, what we call the 1990 target, which is the 390s, meaning you find everybody else who is, who is infected, 90% of them should be found, and 90% of them um, 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 should be on antiviral therapy, and then 90% of those should actually have uh, virus suppression. If you look at Malawi, Malawi has surpassed those targets already. Actually, the targets were increased to 95, 95, 95. And as, as of now, Malawi is actually uh, going to meet those targets if it has probably already surpassed them. So um, in terms of our fight against HIV, I think uh, Malawi is on the right track. And with the, the bringing in of self-testing, which was actually pi piloted mostly in Malawi uh, to the point that it got approved by WHO, um, it's only increasing that ability for people to have options to get tested. And uh, considering the age group that this project was targeting, actually, uh, like Dia has mentioned, it's actually a very difficult group to deal with. And, and, and I think um, uh, targeting, having a more targeted approach is the thing that we need now to, to actually sus to be able to maintain these um, uh, gains that we have made o o over time. Yeah, and the, the, in terms of the healthcare facilities, the problem is um, we get people tested and most people, the issue is about, so what happens when I'm positive? Yeah, and, and, and what does it really mean to me when I'm positive? I think the, the good thing is that we have now the uh, test and treat. So every time somebody is positive, automatically they have to start on antiviral therapy. And in Malawi, antiviral therapy is freely available. So that I think has helped a lot. Uh, 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 the biggest problem is when uh, people start getting um, opportunistic infections like diseases, uh, because we have limited care in the hospitals. So that becomes a problem. But because people are starting antiviral therapy early, the number of people with uh, AIDS, for example, has reduced a lot over the years. Thank you so much. And I think it's really important you brought up the successes because actually if, if COVID's taught us anything, it's that European countries need to learn from African countries just as much as the other way around um, in terms of disease control. So I think it's really important you brought up the successes as well as the challenges. And um, you've brought me nicely on to the next thing I want to talk about with all of you is what needs to happen next. So you've had this really positive program, some good engagement, starting to, to, to change things. How, how do you build on that? Peter, could you kick us off on that? Um, yeah, thank you so much for that. So um, I'll start from I'll start from uh, uh, when we spot, we partnered with um, uh, Aero STM. So it was a successful program, um, but because of COVID, they also it also disturbed the uh, programming and the implementing of activities for Aero STM. That's when uh, Aero STM and Chaco Africa we had to partner that we can follow up with the coaches that we uh, were working with in Chicago. So. I would say it was a successful program. We uh, managed to implement it for a period of four months. And within that four months, we managed to, to, uh, to do a lot. Uh, we managed to give out 322 HIV self-testing kits through the coaches that uh, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine trained. So we follow up with them and then we gave them another refresher training and um, information, more information around uh, use of uh, HIV self-testing kit. And then they went back in the community where they uh, delivered the information but we had to think the other way around to say, why, why should we just give out the information and not give out the services? So we had to bring the tournaments. Also, we had to bring out the referral system where the coaches were like the low models in the community. So they would work with, together with the government and um, they would collect the HIV self-testing kits back to the communities where the players uh, would access easily without going to the health center, without traveling a long distance to access it. So it was close to them which was really positive. By doing that, we managed to give out 322 HIV self-testing kit 
uh, to the uh, young people. And also we managed to reach out to 510 Dalit beneficiaries throughout the football uh, sessions. So when we started, we had 17 coaches. And like uh, when the team started, they had, they had 25 coaches. But because of the COVID-19 and coaches moving out from the district to another, we ended up 2017 coaches, which, um, which was fine. And it was really, really successful. With the data that we collected and the report that we submitted to our partners, LOSTM, we saw that with the period of four months, we managed to do a lot. And um, if we can, um, if we can like try to build up more, I believe we can try to scale up more. We can still try to reach out to a lot of communities uh, because it was successful. And um, a lot of young people love the approach. It started with the pro football and now it continued the football. And now um, they managed to access the services that they wanted to access. So in general, I'll say it was a successful program with few challenges in it. Of course, it will never fail, but it was a successful project. Great. Sarah, what do you think? What, what happens next? How do you build on what you've already done? So I agree with Peter, I think there's a really exciting opportunity for scale up, um, but with that we'll need to come some important sort of considerations. So LSTM, for example, has a real interest in health system strengthening and making sure that the referral pathway from the self-test kit through to accessing treatment, as, as has already been talked about, is youth friendly, is really important. So you know, LSDM has a responsibility as a global health partner to make sure that when we're developing these kind of um, programs, that young people are looked after from start to finish. And so I think that's a really exciting um, potential next step for this work is to think about that full pathway of care, not just using football as a way to um, create an access point, but then looking after that young person from start to finish. The other opportunity really is to think about how we can continue to use uh, the strengths of the amazing coaches that we've um, been working with in Malawi as um, actors uh, to support capacity building um, themselves. So I know Peter himself came from a coaching background and now trains coaches um, in the same way. There's an, a really good opportunity to think about how we can use that, that um, trainer of trainers model to, to scale up um, in a way that is sustainable, both you know, environmentally reduces um, the amount of flights and so on that might need to happen, um, but also from an economic and just a general long-term sustainability perspective. And just, be just before I move on to the next panelist, I think it'd be quite useful if you could just talk us through how the actual testing took place, because you've all touched on it a little bit, but just explain exactly how it took place. Sure. So the, a, a HIV self-testing kit, it's interesting because two and a half years ago, it would have been more difficult to explain, but imagine a lateral flow test. It's really similar. So you, you receive a package which has the uh, information, guidance, pictures that shows you how to do a HIV uh, self-testing kit. You take a self-swab using a swab, which we've all become very familiar with, um, and put it in a little thing, drop it in the well, and then the test result shows. So the key thing with this is that it's a, a kit that you can take home and do in the privacy of your own home. So the coaches were able to demonstrate how to use these kits so that young people felt confident. You know, following those instructions can be quite challenging. Also seeing coaches doing it is quite a sort of confidence building um, sort of thing to observe because you see this coach who, who's confident enough to do it in front of you. Um, but those could, could be taken home and used. The thing is at that point, once people have tested with a self-test kit, there's no automatic referral to HIV services. What that person then needs to do is go to a clinic to access um, a confirmatory test. So that would be done in the same way that we have all gone on to get PCR tests done once we've had done a lateral flow. It's the same thing with the HIV self-testing. And so that's why that, that next step is really important because when they go for that confirmatory test, it needs to be youth friendly. It needs to be a space where they feel confident that they are gonna be uh, treated as uh, people with agency, people who aren't gonna be judged um, and who are going to be looked after from that point onwards. That was really well explained. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, just a word for our audience. If you do have any questions, do pop them in the Q&A box and I'll come to them as soon as I can. So, um, Katie, what about you? How do you think LFC can be involved in the future? And, and what role can sport really play? In, in, in We've talked about role models and the power of bringing people together. Role, what role can sport play in, go, in global health? So I think there's, there's two ways that we'd like to upscale what we're doing. 
Um, Sarah and Peter have both alluded to this, but we'd like to be able to grow the programme in Malawi and be able to reach more people. The research showed last time that the testing went from um, 50% um, right to 84%. Um, so that, that shows a massive significant increase in a short space of time. Um, we're actually also um, looking to upskill and the programme in Liverpool. So Sarah and I have been working together with our team at the foundation um, with some funding from UEFA to develop a Liverpool version of health goals, which looks at a very similar model, but we're looking at sexual health and teenage pregnancy. So we're basically taking the learnings from Malawi, looking at how we delivered the coaching element and applying it to a different type of disease. And um, so that's where we feel there's a massive growth for us to be able to do more. And I think from from an LSC perspective, it's about how we can add value to this. We're not experts, LSTM are experts, Peter's an expert, etc. So it's about how we can sort of bring that, it's almost a bit of that stardust to it, to be able to say, look, um, we showed the video of Sadio Mane doing the saliva test and people listen to him because he's a role model and he's inspirational. So if he can do it, why can't other people? And I think that's where, you know, the, the football brand and other sports can really help with that. Brilliant. And um, Kondwani, you, you've worked on a lot of projects like this. What did you think was particularly innovative here? I mean, obviously, you've got you've got the star power, the involvement of sport. What do you think was particularly innovative, though? I, I think the innovative part of the project is the, having the trainer of trainers. So you have uh, training the coaches because they are role models. So you train those coaches to understand uh, uh, issues to do self-testing and the benefits of it. And then instead of you the trainer taking this message to the community you allow the people you have trained to do that because they speak a language that the community understands so to me i think that is uh, is what is the unique aspect of this project and i think it's something that we can learn from and and and, and take forward what sort of comments and reactions did you get initially and did that change over time sorry that was for kadwani also so, so which change? Come again? I'm just saying in, initially, what sort of comments and reactions did you get? And did that change over time as you conducted the project? I, I think Sarah would be in a best, better position to answer that. All right, you, you've answered then, Sarah. Yeah. Um, I think I can't really speak for what the initial comments might have been looking like, but certainly the comments that came towards the end, um, what was really interesting was exactly uh, what uh, Dr. Kondwani just mentioned there. So it was speaking in a language that young people engage with and understood and almost translating techno, techno, techno speak that we might use as um, health promotion people into ideas that are familiar with young people. But it wasn't just that, it was also that parents and the wider community saw this activity happening and there was a ripple effect whereby, you know, it, it was not just the young people who are now interested in self-testing, but also their parents, their siblings, their friends. So the, the main comments that came back really were that this was something that had fundamentally changed the conversations about HIV self-testing within the community. And that was, as people have talked about here, it was through genuine conversations through these from these coaches and the exciting sort of role model activities that we saw with the video with Sadio. Um, and then also the, I guess the big rags Mataz events of the of the football festivals because there was you know loads of activity going on loads of people watching it, it it felt like an exciting thing to be having a conversation about so those are sort of the main things that came back when we were talking with young people and and coaches about their experiences and it's great to hear the excitement but also the fact that you've got families involved it's not it's not just young people yeah. um peter have you got anything to add in terms of the comments and how people change their reactions over time uh, yeah, definitely. So, um, I think I think as I said earlier, using using football, um, it's a concept that young people enjoy playing football, and it's like we're just giving out the information to something they're already doing, plus they enjoy it, plus they it creates an environment where young people can speak free with the coach, discuss around sexual reproductive health and rights, HIV, self testing, self testing kit information, in environment where they're not be judged, they're free to talk about it. Now. In some areas in Malawi, it's a new approach. For example, in Chihuahua, it was a new approach where they'll see playing football at the same time, they're also learning something um, from the football, healthy-wise. So the comments that came out 
I'll give an example. Uh, when we were doing um, the tournament last year in December, one of the court came to me to say, uh, this is a new approach. We have never experienced this. And that coach is like 35 years old. We always knew football as a two, that we should engage people, but we never knew that football has the power where you can engage young people and give out the information. So the feedback was positive because it's a new approach. It's a new innovative idea where young people now, they love it, they enjoy doing it. At the same time, they're also getting information out of it. So um, we have a saying in Jaguar Africa where we say, give us a football and we'll give you young people. Because we have the football and you are young people, they will have they love football. So give us the football, young people will come to us. So um the feedback was positive. Um the coaches received the program. Um not only the coaches, as Sarah said, even the parents, even the friends, when the, on the tournament day, we will don't only target only the participants that are participating in the program, but also have the general community come to watch football because it's the tournament. By doing the same, we have the services being given out at the pitch. Now the general community is also accessing the same services. HIV testing kids, we end up giving out more to the general community because they come to us, uh, the tournament. So it's not just about the participants in general, but using of sport um, would also target the general community outside the program, like the injury beneficiaries, where they save it and they also access the services in a way that they didn't even expect it. So the feedback was positive uh, from the coaches themselves, the participants themselves, the general community, even the government officials that we worked with. So we worked very closely with the district uh, sports office. We worked very close with the um, district health office where we get the self-testing kit to give out to the community. So everyone was like, how does this work? We didn't know about this, we didn't know about that. But now we understand how it works. And I think it's a very, very important too that young people should be using uh, football to, um, to reach out to other young people in the community with information around health. So it can be any healthy programs, any thematic area around health. So I'd say with this program, the uh, feedback was very, was very, very positive. That's really great to hear. So we're getting a couple of audience questions in, but if you do have questions, do pop them in the in the question box and I can start to come to them. Um, let me take one of them now, actually. So uh, this is a question for, for, for Peter and Katie. Can you let us know how many of the 25 coaches were training girls? Don't know if you have that. Yeah, so that was one of the points that I was going to make um, that Sarah and Peter sort of alluded to again, that um, we, we coach four of the girls in, in the project. And I think what was really interesting was that initially the programme was about how do we reach young boys. But as we were starting to do the coaching and getting more people interested, there would be all the families around wanting to know more about it, including girls. So not only did we get to engage more girls in playing football, but we also got to engage more people in the conversation about HIV. So from my perspective, when I went to Malawi to see the programme, what I was most sort of shocked about was that actually people didn't know how they could contract HIV. And despite the fact that it's a widespread global disease, a lot of young people didn't even know enough about it. So when we were talking about how you can catch it and things that are false and things that are you know, not true and, and how we basically use the sports coaching and the football to give them the answers to those questions. But it was a really safe space and it was a fun environment too. So even though we were talking about a disease that is horrendous and quite scary and um, we were able to break down those barriers because we were making it fun and engaging so that people would ask more questions as they were involved in the session. That's really interesting hearing about that and was there anything I mean you, you talked about being shocked that people didn't know how HIV was contracted was there anything else that surprised you while while you were on your visit and talking to people? Um, yeah I think the fact that it just HIV wasn't discussed um, and in the first session that I went to where we were in a room with the coaches that we were training, even they weren't necessarily aware of everything surrounding HIV. So we were all we were educating the coaches and then they were going to educate the communities. And I think that's why it was so important, because we managed to get the feedback from the coaches because they were asking questions that the participants we're then going to ask so we could preempt that and think about the best way to deliver the messages because there's still quite a lot of um, taboo around the subject of HIV and sometimes when we were planning this and, and coming in as LSTM and, and LFC we wanted to make sure that everything we did connected to the community and that was why it was really important to be able to talk to the coaches about what they did and didn't know and sort of misconceptions of HIV and AIDS. Peter or Sarah, anything to add to that on the, on the question of girls specifically? Otherwise, I'll go to the next question. 
You look like you want to say something, Sarah. Well, I was just to add, so yeah, there were the four um, female coaches who were trained as, as part of the programme. Um, what was really striking, as Katie exactly said, was that um, it wasn't just those female coaches who saw an increase in girls participating in football as a result of this project. So we saw increased female participation across all of the different locations. So, you know, you would go to a session and a good sort of fifth of the participants would probably be girls. And one of the big demands almost, the next steps that was asked of us by coaches was to think about how can we increase sports provision for girls. And the important thing about that potentially is the role that sport can have in developing important life skills with girls around um, you know, empowerment and feeling confident to have uh, challenging conversations and also boys and girls being used to having those kind of conversations together, which are important determinants of the transmission of HIV. So sport can have a role, not just at the uh, knowledge end or just in terms of access to services, but also um, sort of those other wider determinants of, of HIV. Yeah, it's connecting everything up, isn't it? And giving people those life skills that's so important. Peter, do you have anything to add on the importance of having girls involved as well? Um, yes, yeah, sure. So um, the time that we train uh, the coaches when we followed up with the university project, uh, we had only two female coaches that were, that were trained as coaches. And we had one male coach that uh, was targeting the female players in the community. So at the end of the program, when we did the monitoring and evaluation, try to get the data out of the information, uh, out, of, out of the project, uh, we'll see that there was a lot of increase in confidence among the girls that participated in the program in terms of accessing uh, the self-testing kit, which was not there before, as Kate said. So before it was not easy, the girl would be like, I cannot, I cannot do that. This is for men, and men will only do the HIV self-testing kit. So those kind of barriers. But when they participated in the program and the use of girls in the program, it managed to um, increase the impact of the project in the sense that um, the confidence was high. There, would, uh, there was an increase in the confidence plus the knowledge as well. Plus Sarah said, uh, Sarah already said it. Um, when there's, a, um, when you're talking about SRHR or HIV self-testing kit information, sometimes it's better that we uh, combine girls and boys to have a chat about it. Because some questions would be there around uh, the, the, uh, the boys asking out the boys around question where the girls would be able to respond to them. So if there's that environment where we can have boys and girls in the same place talking about safe testing kit, I think it's ideal uh, and it will also increase the impact of the project. So this project, we had two coaches trained targeting the female participants and one coach, which was male, targeting the female participants. So it was good to see that the females were also taking part in the project. And it's just connecting people up to actually have that openness of conversation to begin with. Exactly, yeah, um, exactly. We've got another com uh, a question about whether you could use the same techniques to deliver other health messages, such as testing for TB, for instance. Kondwani, do you want, do you want to come in on that one? Um, yeah, the principle should work, I think, the same way you'd work with self-testing. The difference is that with TB, you wouldn't be self-testing, it would be referrals. So you would be encouraging people to go uh, to different health facilities when they face, uh, you have, this, have, to have a, a, a list of symptoms uh, that people could actively monitor themselves. Uh, so the, the, the issue would be self-monitoring, not self-testing. So they'll monitor themselves and then uh, you'd have to give them options where they can go as a referral aspect. So it wouldn't be as straightforward as self-testing, but the principle is, is, is the same. You're giving the person uh, the power to make the decision themselves with the correct information. So TB is slightly more complicated. Um, Sarah, what, what do you think? Other, other healthcare conditions this could be applied for? Yeah, I absolutely agree that, you know, it's often more challenging when you don't have a snap, here's your results um, test option, but using a really structured way of, of monitoring exactly that, your symptoms for TB, or, you know, we've talked um, about LFC, um, the work that we're looking to do in Liverpool, that will be about, um, you know, accessing preventative services potentially, so accessing um, condoms and um, other contraceptions if, if necessary. So I think that that opportunity for referral is really um, exciting. 
if you can integrate it with um, that first point of contact with the health system in terms of a, a test or in terms of the conversation uh, with a healthcare um, provider or a community health worker, then all the better. But at least a, a means of building confidence to go, go out to that um, community healthcare point and, and access that service is, is a really exciting opportunity, I feel, for, for these kind of projects. Mm. And something I asked Katie earlier, was there anything that surprised you when you started working on the project or is there something that you really took away from it that you, that you didn't quite expect? I think the thing that was just really striking was how willing people were to work together. So the different organisations that sort of got stuck in and helped out. So PSI jumping in, providing self-testing kits, MLW doing their thing. Um, Tackle Africa have been brilliant uh, post-pandemic, doing that work to follow up. So it's that willingness um, with people who are with a shared vision for um, you know, positive health outcomes for young people. And it just took something to bring everybody together. And, and the more we can find those opportunities to bring people together, I think that's how we can have impact. So um, I was surprised but delighted at um, how enthused people were. And I think, to be honest, the excitement of the LFC badge was a, a bit of a, a factor in that as well. And it's so brilliant that you can empower people to take control of their healthcare in, on something like this. Um, Katie, here's, here's a question that you could kick us off on. Any chance of expanding this work through partnering with Everton, Tranmere Rovers or crew? <laughs> so, um, yeah, 100%. I think one of the, the whole reasons for today and for us being able to sort of disseminate the research is to be able to share best practice and find ways for, up to, for us to upscale this. And we're definitely not precious as an organisation that it's just something with our name on. And um, I think when we first started the project, we did contribute some money financially from the foundation to deliver the project, but only a small element. So if other football organisations or sporting organisations wanted to join in, then that would be brilliant because I think, as you can tell from all the conversations we've had today, there's need for this and there's need for us to do more. So 100%. I hope they're watching <laughs> and they'll come on board. Um, Someone else asks about scaling up in Malawi. Is this something that's underway already? Kundwani, can you start us off on that one? Is it scaling up happening already? Uh, not something that I'm aware of at the, at the moment, but it's something that I really wanted to, to, to talk about as well. Is, uh, this is a, was a pilot project in a, in a specific setting in Chikwawa. Uh, Malawi is quite diverse. I think it would be good to, 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 to scale up and to see if this approach, approach works, would work elsewhere. I can give you an example. For me, uh, if you ask me the question, was I surprised? I will tell you, I was actually surprised that it worked so well uh, in a sense that we did something similar with the MOW here in Blantyre City. We had football tournaments and we called the project Science in Unusual Places. So, um, uh, and we, we used the same approach of using football, football and the output from that work is very similar to this being done in Chikwawa, which is a rural site. We did this in Blantyre City. So that tells me that this approach is something that has a, a high chance of success if you take it else across uh, the country, as well as work with the Football Association of Malawi, for example, uh, 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 as part of its um, um, uh, agenda to help move this, this forward. And the last point I would make on this is to have uh, LFC consider having the, 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 their, their off season or something in Malawi, you just have a visit. I think it, it would help. I remember, I think a couple of years back, the English FA uh, had uh, David, they had um, David James here and they had Rio Ferdinand and they had Guy Neville. So, it, and, 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 and that helps uh, because people really here like football, like, like, like Peter mentioned. That's a, an idea we'll leave with Katie to take back. Um, and thanks for preempting. I was going to ask you whether you were surprised by anything, so you preempted my question. Um, there's also a point being made about whether this approach could apply to other African countries. What do you think, Peter? Um, I think it's I think it's something that can work in um, in other countries. So. I'll, I'll talk from experience, Tackle Africa working in um, 10 African countries using the power of football to reach out to the young people. So from experience, I'll say, it's something that is already there, it's already working. It's just a matter of maybe scaling it up to more beneficiaries, but 
Africa and football, it's like they really match. African football, young people and football really match. So if we take it to across other countries of Africa, I would say it's positive. It's a welcome idea. We can uh, look into those areas because it's something which is positive. Africa loves football, young people loves football. As Kent said at some point, uh, around uh, using the badge of uh, Liverpool Foundation, we have Sergio Mane there. It's like um, inspiration to a lot of young people. They think about Sergio Mane playing for Liverpool and it's an inspiration to that. So, yes, it's a positive idea. It's already happening. As South Africa, they're working on it and scaling it up to other countries in Africa. I think it's a positive idea and it's something that we would uh, love to see in the future. Just a quick word to the audience, if you want to get a question in, be quick, because we haven't got much longer, we've only got a few minutes. Um, let's talk quickly about cost, because this does cost money. How did you fund it? Who paid for it? Sarah? I think Katie's probably going to be better placed to answer that one. I just spend the money. <laughs> Go on, Katie, you tell us. So, the original pilot for this programme was um, funded through the LSC Foundation, but there was a lot of in-kind support from LSTM and all of the partners that we've talked about today. So we actually did this project on quite a small budget for the amount of work that we've done and the amount of hours that Sarah's done her research. Um, so um, for us to scale this up, and deliver it on a, on a much wider scale into big, uh, different regions of Malawi and potentially other countries, we'd, we'd need to look at way more than half a million pounds to get this moving. Um, but I think that that doesn't, that undersells almost the value and in-kind support of the amount of people that have done things on the ground to make this happen. So money's great, but actually the most important thing to make this work is the partnerships. And I think to Peter's point, there's lots of great work already happening in Africa using football, but for us to be able to upscale this into different regions or to different countries, we'd need strong partnerships like we've got here already, and it will take a bit of time to do that in other countries for us to be able to, to upscale it quickly. That's a really good point, because you want to make sure that those relationships are strong enough when you're introducing something that's, that's challenging and new. Um, Sarah, we've talked a lot about upscaling and there's been ideas about other countries, other, other um, locations in Malawi. What would upscaling look like for you? What are your aspirations for what comes next? And so we have a, a big dream vision, I suppose, of Health Goals Goes Global. Um, so thinking about how we can apply this model, which is centred around partnership um, across different contexts. And as uh, Dr. Kondwam has already mentioned, um, there's this thing with this approach that seems to suggest that rural areas, urban areas, it has potential. Um, so thinking about, are there areas where at the moment, there's some really successful examples of um, football being used for health promotion across certainly the African continent, but also beyond. Um, are there areas where those organizations are struggling to reach? Is it something that we can um, think about how we can reach those regions using this approach? Um, is it that there are specific dimensions of sexual reproductive health that are currently being missed as a result of, um, or through the current provision? Is there something that we can do to fill that? Um, and again, this uh, from point of contact through to uh, treatment and, and long-term care being youth friendly um, so yeah the dream the vision health goals goes global um, could potentially be a multi-country project maybe initially in, on the African continent but continent but also beyond you know um, this is you know adolescence that it's a really large group and it's an, a vital time for reaching people with regards to their health. If we invest in adolescents, we get a benefit now, the adolescent is healthy, they become a healthy adult, and then their ne the next generation of children is healthier as well. So if we get it right when, we, when, when we're talking about young people, um, then it can have a massive impact. So um, I think we'd, we'd like to say we'd, we'd love to dream big um, on that side. Well, it's good to dream big. And your point about getting in there early is also really important. Um, last couple of minutes peter just give us a sense for anyone who who wants to be involved in this work and is sort of a bit reluctant how would you really encourage them to get involved and why is it so important i uh, thank you so much for that opportunity so um i would strongly i would strongly encourage um another big bodies organizations that they want to partner they want to 
uh, work more on this uh, use of sports to reach out to the young people because it's very important, as we've talked about already. Young people are at very at very risk of uh, contracting HIV, and we also know that the knowledge around HIV is sometimes very low because of a lot of activities that happens around them. So it's a very very special target that we need to work with adolescent young girls and young women as long as well as uh, young boys. So I would say it's evident that is positive with the um, amount of time that we had and um, the budget that was there and the partnership that was there after, after COVID, there were challenges, but we still managed to uh, produce this good impact from the project with the partners, with the partnership from LSTM, Maui Liverpool Welcome Trust, and was uh, Liverpool Foundation. So it's positive that we would encourage that uh, if there are partners that we need to partner with, we need to work with, let's do that, let's keep the partnership strong and begin to keep the communication channels open so that we can still help the young people in the community in Malawi and maybe we can also scale it out to other other countries in Africa. Well thank, thank you, you so much. I think, I think that was a really important appeal and probably the right note to end it on that kind of encouraging people to, to get on board and uh, really do their bit for such an important project. Thank you so much to all of you for a really fascinating conversation. Thank you to the audience for these questions. Um, don't forget, this is the first of many, many events um, to celebrate 125 years of LSTM. But for now, Peter, Katie, Kondwani and Sarah, thank you so much for sharing your work with us uh, and allowing us to hear about all the amazing things you've done in Malawi. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.